Hi everyone, this is the lecture to accompany chapter two in your textbook. Please also read chapter two as it contains a lot of information that I don't have time to address in this lecture. Okay, let's discuss groups as structured open systems. You might be familiar with the Disney movie, Cool Runnings. It's a fun movie about a highly unlikely bobsled team that competes in the Olympics, but it's actually based on a true story. The bobsledders were Jamaican athletes who had never even seen snow, let alone have had anything to do with bobsleds before the 1998 Winter Olympic Games in Calgary. But because of their talent and determination, they made it all the way there. Even though they didn't win due to an accident with their bobsled, they won the hearts of everyone there and have become a symbol for the persistence, determination, and teamwork required to compete at the highest level in athletics. And for purposes of what we do in this class, they are an excellent example of the concept of systems theory and how it works in groups. This team is brought up throughout the chapter, illustrating the different ideas we're going to be talking about today. So make sure you read the chapter because this illustration does make the information easier to understand. When someone mentions the word theory, your eyes might start to glaze over. You might think theories are academic in nature and don't really have a place in our everyday lives, but you use theories all the time. You just don't think about them as theories. Theories are bodies of knowledge that people use to explain things that happen. The book refers to them as maps of reality that once you know them and understand them can possibly apply to things that you're not familiar with. A good theory is practical. It works to explain things, and we can rely on it to help us navigate life. So let's move on to general systems theory, which was developed by biologist Ludwig von Bertalanffy in 1928 to describe the workings of complex living organisms. For instance, the human body itself is a complex organism made up of a series of systems, the lymphatic, cardiovascular, skeletal, muscular, nervous system, etc. Systems theory is a way to help understand and explain the interconnectedness of these systems, how they interact with and work with each other. Since this isn't an anatomy class, we won't be studying the human body. But think about it. A group is a living entity made up of different individuals who must interact and work with each other in much the same way that the different systems in our body need to work with each other in order to keep us alive. So it makes sense to apply general systems theory to groups in order to understand how they function. Let's use the Jamaican bobsled team as an example of a system. A group is made up of several elements, in the case of the bobsled team, that would be people, that influence one another. But outside influences affect the group as well, and the group can also affect its environment. The different people in this group with their unique abilities and characteristics had a great effect on the group as a whole. Also, the team's plan, how they decided who was going to take each position on the bobsled, that had an effect. Then the leadership skills of the coach and all the other group members and the personal interactions within the group, that affected it. Finally, the effect of their environment, both in Jamaica as they were practicing and in Calgary and all the things they had to face there. And of course, they had a major effect on the people in their homeland as well as the entire Olympic community. So the bobsled team was interdependent with one another, and the group is interdependent with its environment. We're going to talk more later about the concept of interdependence. First, we need to look at some concepts that are vital to understanding systems, inputs, throughputs, outputs, and the environment. What are inputs? They are the elements of a system that are present at the formation of the group the initial raw materials. These are the things that, when the group is formed, are already in place. So these elements are the qualities, personalities, characteristics, abilities, talents, and skills that each member brings to the group. The resources that are already available to the group, like information about the task and the amount of time that exists to work on the task. And the environment, where the group meets, what the physical surroundings are, and how much support the group has from the entity that formed it in the first place. So, inputs are what is brought to the group or what already exists when the group is formed. 
Throughputs are what actually happens within the group as it works toward the goal. So that includes the member behaviors, the ways that they interact with each other, the group norms. Norms are the explicit and implicit rules of behavior. Explicit meaning they're written down and talked about, and implicit means that it's just something that you do as a group. You don't talk about it. Communication networks, the types of ways that members use to get their messages across to each other. The status relationships within the group, leadership, power, and influence among the members. And procedures, how do you get things done? Talking to each other, making decisions, doing research, implementing solutions. In other words, as it says here, throughputs are everything the group does while working on the task and towards the goal. Outputs are the result of the inputs and throughputs, the tangible and intangible products or achievements of the group. So some of the tangible or real physical results of a small group could be the final decisions or recommendations of the group that you put into a report or a presentation with objects like PowerPoints or other visual aids, speeches, or even actual physical objects that the group is designed to create. An example of this might be a prototype of a car that's created by a work group at an automotive manufacturer. But there are lots of intangible outcomes of working with a small group. These may not have anything to do necessarily with the task or goal of the group, but they can be extremely valuable to the group members if they're positive, like friendships that blossom between members or feelings of satisfaction and personal growth, or they might be not so positive, like feelings of animosity or dissatisfaction. Groups do not exist in a vacuum. They're part of their surroundings or environment. The text uses the term bona fide group perspective to help explain how a group is influenced by and influences its environment. Here are some of the ways this happens. Group members are influenced by other groups to which they belong. So your group would be influenced by your interaction with your family, your friends, any work groups that you are a member of. Groups may also coordinate or work with other groups within the same system, such as two different work groups at the same workplace might share information or processes. Groups communicate within and throughout the larger environment to interpret goals, as when a group approaches management for clarification on their task or maybe sends a representative to a meeting to get more information. There's a really good example in the textbook about a student group that worked to make the streets surrounding their campus safer after a girl was killed crossing the street. It shows how much the group had to interact with and was influenced by their environment and what they had to do to be successful. So make sure you read that. It's pretty obvious that groups have to effectively interact with their environment in order to get the job done. Now this can be a bit more difficult if the group is virtual. In other words, if the group never meets face to face. Some groups in the business world work in this fashion. They are collaborative groups. The members of these groups are often more influenced by their own environments than they are by the group itself, which might be good, but it also might inhibit the group's work. It's just something that you need to take into account if you ever find yourself in an online virtual group. Another concept of systems theory is the difference between closed and open systems. The definition of a closed system is a system that has limited flow of information between itself and its environment. In other words, it's pretty much cut off from the environment. An open system has a free exchange of information with its environment, that is, with inputs and outputs flowing back and forth between the system and its environment. There are no completely closed systems, at least in the social world as we understand it. An example of a physical closed system might be a thermos in which you place either hot or cold fluid, and because there's only limited exchange of energy and no exchange of molecules, the process of the liquid becoming less hot or cold is slowed down, but it's still not stopped. It doesn't stay the same temperature forever. 
So groups, like everything else in society, are open systems, although they can be more or less open depending on the circumstances. The Jamaican bobsled team, for example, interacted not just with each other, but with their friends, families, and fans, as well as with the other bobsled teams and the Olympic officials. All these people affected them, and they in turn affected all those people with whom they came in contact. There are both advantages and disadvantages to openness in systems. For instance, the more open a system, the less control a supervisor or manager of that group might have over it. And the more closed a system, the less possibly helpful information might be accessed by that group. Overall, though, a more open group has more access to outside information and knowledge, and therefore probably has a better chance of success. Because the interactions between the group and its environment is so important, all group members must act as what the textbook refers to as boundary spanners. A boundary spanner is someone who scans the environment and helps regulate the flow of information into and out of the group. They do this by scouting information and coordinating activities, which adds to the resources of the group. So they help bring information into the group that's going to assist the group in working towards its goal. But they also protect the group from outside influences that might harm the group and keep information within the group that should stay there. For example, maybe your group has come up with a creative way to give your presentation and you don't want the other groups to find out about it because you want it to be unique and to stand out. So, boundary spanners work to go outside the boundaries of the group to get necessary information and resources and can also bring up the boundaries of the group to keep some information and resources inside the group. Now, let's talk a little bit about the term interdependent that I've already said a couple of times. When things, and that includes people, are dependent on and influence each other, those things are interdependent. Group members depend on and rely on each other in order to accomplish the group's goal. And any element, including an idea, a behavior, or a person, can change the functioning of the entire group for better or worse. So it's good to realize how much you can influence the groups working well together or possibly having problems reaching the goal. Each member of the group has responsibility to the group as a whole. That's interdependence. Group work often involves returning system outputs back into the system as inputs. What do I mean by that? Well, outputs don't have to refer just to the final result. This input-throughput-output process actually happens continually during the lifetime of the group. Here's an example. Let's say that you are assigned to do some individual research for your part of the task. Then you bring your results to a meeting and share them with the group. That's output because it's the result of your work. But once you've shared it, that information now becomes input and is used by the group to continue the process until they arrive at the final product. So it's kind of a circular process and that circular process of returning outputs back into the system as inputs is called feedback. Let's talk for a moment about the concepts of multiple causes and multiple paths. Systems tend to be complex organisms or entities. With groups, Outcomes tend to be dependent on many, many factors or causes. You generally can't pinpoint one single reason as the cause for the success or failure of a group's project. Lots of factors have a hand in that. That's called multiple causes. Another related concept is multiple paths. There's not necessarily only one correct way to achieve any goal. Any objective can often be reached in different ways. It's the ways that a group decides to proceed that contribute to the uniqueness and the effectiveness of that group. So here's the illustration from your textbook that shows how a small group functions in an open system. It's got examples of the different kinds of things that qualify as inputs, throughputs, and outputs, with a line from the outputs back to the inputs to show how they feed back through the system. And of course, the environment is always there and always has an impact on the group. The final concept we're going to discuss today is that of synergy. 
You may have heard the saying that a group is more than the sum of its parts. A group is not just a bunch of people working together. A group becomes its own entity, its own living, breathing creation. Sometimes that entity performs better than any one individual in the group could. That's positive synergy. Sometimes it performs worse than any one individual. That's called negative synergy. There are lots of reasons why these things could happen. Remember, groups are complex organisms, but some of the main factors in whether a group has positive or negative synergy are being able to trust each other, being able to work together when it comes to problem solving, having the ability to overcome obstacles faced by the group, and of course, having effective communication skills. Remember, groups are interdependent by nature. Each member is crucial to the effectiveness of the group as a whole. Communication is the key to success in your groups. This is the end of the lecture on Chapter 2.